game number nine of the FIDE Best Ever World Chess Championship. We have Jan with the white pieces and Dingleren with the black pieces. Will we see a Roy Lopez or a French defense? Because we have one E4 by Jan. Keep in mind, Jan is up one game in the match. And this game has some excitement coming up. So we're going to do something new. We're bringing on a heart rate monitor. So you can see how high my heart rate spikes with this excitement. Okay, pawn to E5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5. This is a Roy Lopez. And now we see knight to f6, a Berlin defense by Ding. And d3. This is a common way to avoid the Berlin main lines, whereas castling, you get into those lines with like knight takes e4, you can reach the Berlin endgame. Bishop c5. And around this point, you see white scoring 57, 58% in the master database. c3. Creating a home for this light square bishop. Also maybe preparing d4 or b4. These moves are pretty standard. And then we see d5. This is an active move by Ding Loren, And what he's doing is he's grabbing space in the center. And these positions do tend to give white just a real slight advantage. So Jan has a comfortable, solid advantage. E pawns trade off. Pawn to a5. 52 games in the database still. And a4 played by Jan. Now we're starting to get into rare territory, queen e7, queen c2, but you'll notice there aren't any big imbalances in the position, right? Both sides are missing a d pawn. All the other pawns are symmetric except the c pawns. And then we see knight to b8, the most common move. Uh, this has been played by Kramnik and Nakamura, Nakamura twice actually, both last year and this year. Rook to e1 played, solid position, but it is going to heat up a little bit. Don't worry. Rick to d8, h3, h6, knight f1. Um, the idea with knight f1 is the knight could head to e3, g3, and then maybe come into the f5 square. Also, knight to h4 could head to the f5 square, so watch for Jan to start shifting his pieces over to the king side. c6. <laughs> so now we see complete symmetry with the pawns and the bishops on the queen side. The only differences are this queen should be on e2, rook on d1, and knight on b1. So who does this favor? I would say white very slightly because the knight on f1 is closer to this king side play. But what Ding is going to do is he's going to play on the queen side. So he's going to play knight a6 and pawn to b5. He's not worried about bringing that knight all the way over to the king side route. Knight a6, knight to g3, targeting this f5 square, queen c7, and bishop a2. So dropping the bishop back, still eyeing this pawn on f7, which is pinned to the king. And Ding would like to play active on the queen side. So we got king side play for Jan, queen side play for Ding. That's the dynamic. b5, queen to e2. So now Jan is threatening a takes b5, winning a pawn. But the queen is also ready to come over here to the king side. So keep an eye on this king side attack by Jan. And we know Jan likes to attack. Rook to b8. An inaccuracy. The first inaccuracy of the game comes from Ding. Um, what he would like to play is bishop to f8 to defend the king side and then attack queen side. Well, it's actually a little bit stronger to play bishop to f8 first. Just be more prepared for Ding's or for Jan's attack over there. So knight h4, excellent move. Trying to infiltrate the king side, bishop f8. Now queen to f3, targeting the knight. So bishop takes h6 is a threat. He takes a4. Now we're in for some excitement again. Ding is deciding, let's play active on the queen side. Let's grab that extra pawn. Bishop takes h6, and that bishop cannot be captured because queen takes knight, and this king side is falling apart for Ding. So he ignores it. Top move, knight to c5. Now the idea is rook takes b2, knight to b3. Ding is trying to go up a pawn over here, and if he can trade one pawn for one pawn, and be left with a passed a pawn that can give winning chances on the queen side for ding to counter the winning chances on the king side for yan now here look for yan to play bishop to g5 at some point trying to pin the knight to the rook that could cause big problems for ding he doesn't play it immediately i think i would have um, it can be met with rook to d3 so active counterplay instead he plays knight to g6 Utilizing this pin on the f pawn, possibly threatening knight takes f8, 
Um, also possibly still planning bishop to g5. So kind of an uncomfortable position for Ding. You just see all of these pieces around your king. Rook takes b2 played. Fearless. And the threat is rook takes a2, removing the piece that pins the f-pawn. So after rook takes a2, rook takes back, f takes g6. And Ding would be able to get two pieces for the rook. So Jan plays knight takes f8. Rook takes f8. Note the material count. Ding is still up one pawn. And there is still a small advantage for Jan to play with. So white has a small edge here. Bishop to g5. Threatening bishop takes f6. And Ding finds the best reply. Looking at the engine, it was slightly better to play bishop to c4. And this is the best way to keep the advantage. So what happens, let's just say, if black tries to trade off a pair of bishops? Because that would eliminate the bishop pair advantage for Jan. There's now knight to f5. Excellent move. And if bishop takes c4, it looks like that guy is hanging. Bishop takes g7, hitting the rook, hitting the knight. More importantly, hitting the knight, which is for free. The queen to d8. Now there's bishop to h6, threatening queen to g3 and queen to g7. Checkmate. King h7, queen g3. And if rook to g8, trying to prevent mate, there's queen h4. White is completely winning. Um, so if we go back a little bit after this move, knight to f5, you could play bishop takes f5, um, e takes f5, or sorry, queen takes f5, and Jan would be holding his comfortable advantage. But instead, he doesn't play bishop to c4. He plays bishop to g5. And Ding responds with knight to h7. Good move. Rook c1. And now rook to b5. Slight inaccuracy by Ding. Rook to c2 would have been a little bit better with the plan of knight to b3. Bishop to a3 by Jan. And now that pins the knight, so there's no easy knight to b3 anymore. Good move by Jan. Rook to e8. Bishop c4. And now we see an excellent move by Ding, bishop to e6, offering the exchange. And this is an interesting way to play it. Bishop takes b5, c takes b5. It's still in that small edge territory for Jan. He did not go for this, and I'm a little bit surprised. I think he would rather have dynamic piece play than material. So he decides to take this bishop and go this route. Um, he knows he has knight, bishop, and queen all ready to attack over here on the king side. Strong move by Ding, though. Pawn to c5, shutting out that bishop, removing any sort of threat of a piece coming into d6. And then rook to b3 by Ding, playing very active, poking at the c pawn. Queen c4, queen c6. This is defending the pawn on a4 that was being attacked. Bishop c1, knight f6. Queen takes a4, back to equal material. And now all of a sudden, trades, trades start to happen. I'm going to fast forward this a little bit because a lot of times in past world championship matches, when we see all of these trades happening, they tend to lead towards easy draws. But as we've seen, these players don't like easy draws. So we get to this position and Ding makes this choice. This is a big decision, critical moment. He plays knight to d4. So the problem here for black, you have this bishop and knight lingering around your king. If this knight ever moves, the g pawn can be captured. And the rook is also nearby. Like maybe the rook can come down a7, a8. So that's something that Ding has to be careful about. He calculates that he can sacrifice a pawn here in order to hold the defense. Knight to d4. So we got takes, takes, takes. Now it's a rook and knight endgame. Three pawns for white, two for black. Keep in mind, this is a draw with best play. But when we see these types of endgames, there's no risk for white to play it out. So Jan is trying to figure out, how do I make this as difficult as possible for Ding? And Ding is trying to simplify the draw. So he plays g6. This is kind of inviting. Knight to d6, maybe going for a trade. And we'll see that Ding offers trades a couple times. This is just getting fancy. Uh, if f takes g, rook takes knight. But it doesn't really do a lot. And now knight to f5. This is a really hard move to play. I'm looking at it thinking, whoa, maybe I should take that knight if I'm playing the white pieces. Yes, it's three pawns versus two in a rook endgame, but these two pawns are isolated doubled pawns. Like, Wouldn't that be a good chance to play for the win? Jan decides no. He, he figures Ding will hold that too easily if I just trade knights. And then Ding says, all right, well, maybe we should trade rooks. Figuring rook trade, knight takes back, 
knight and pawn endgame should be an easy enough draw for him. Jan says nope. So now they shuffle a little bit. Let's get to the next interesting moment. F5. So Ding decides, I'm not going to keep that pawn on F7. I see your king, Jan, trying to march up the board. I'm going to try to make things happen. And I like the way that Ding is playing this. He's going for an active defense. This is something that if you don't play active and you sit back and wait too long, maybe white can create some threats that you can't handle. So after F5, king to F3 was played, attacking the rook. So that has to move. Rook A8 check offers a rook trade. Um, if rook takes e7, king takes e7, that king is so close to the f6 square. Should be a pretty easy draw for ding. Rook to a8 check played. Offers a rook trade. After rook to e8. Now at this point, Jan decides to take. Um, he really can't do anything else besides repeat or trade because his knight is being attacked. This is the best way to get the trade for Jan because at least the king is back on the 8th rank, a little bit further from these pawns. So now we see knight to e5, and g5 is forced. So these pawns are pretty far extended, and Jan plays, I think, the trickiest move on the board, pawn to h4, separating the pawns. So now if these two pawns drop, white is winning. But if, Jan, if Ding can hold at least one of them, it should be a draw. h3 played by Ding. Again, he's looking for these very active moves. G takes h3. King to e7. Now, at this point, the computer is still saying draw, but there's a lot of moves on the board. Knight to c6 check was played. King f6. Knight back to d4. Knight to e4. Pawn to f3 by Jan. Knight to f2. Attacking this pawn. h4. This is all still draw territory. Knight d3 check. King g3. King g6. Thing is doing a great job holding this. Knight to e6. King to f6. Knight to f4. You do not want to take the knight. Knight takes knight is a win for white. This king takes and this pawn is going to run. If the king goes over to win it, white wins this pawn and will win the king and pawn endgame. So after knight to f4, knight to b4 was played by Ding. And king to f2, king to e5. So as of this recording, the players are still playing, but the writing is on the wall. This is going to be a draw. If for some reason it's not a draw, I will post an update video to this. You'll see it on the YouTube page. This should be a draw though, and I don't want to drag it out any longer. So thanks for watching. We will still have Jan up one game, rest day tomorrow, and then on Sunday, we got the next game. I will be doing a recap of that as well. Um, tomorrow, we will have a live stream on our YouTube channel analyzing your guys' games. So check out the link in the description below. Submit a game or just come hang out, watch with us, and maybe you can learn something from other people's games. All right, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video and hopefully see you tomorrow.